Y'all ready, everyone? Mm-hmm. We're live. Hello, fellow listeners. Welcome to another edition of Socialist Action Webcast, and a special welcome to those joining us for the first time. I hope that last week you enjoyed our May Day. If you didn't see it live, please go on our Socialist Action YouTube and see it there. My name is Elizabeth Bice and I am the Federal Treasurer of Socialist Action, a member of the NDP Socialist Caucus Steering Committee. We acknowledge that this event is taking place on Indigenous lands across Turtle Island known as North America. That includes the unceded territories of the Mississauga of the New Credit, the Wendat and Audenoshani people in a place called Toronto. Today I'm speaking to you from Jamaica where the indigenous Taino and Arawak speaking people began arriving here 4,000 years ago, but were wiped out by the European colonial powers. We join in the fight for justice, recognizing that there can be no real reconciliation without restitution. That entails seizing the assets of the big resource corporations and returning them to the commons. Tonight's topic the Persecution of Julian Assange, featuring Jeff Mackler and panelists John Sanderson and Corey David. Jeff will speak for 20 minutes, followed by John and Corey for seven min minutes each. After that, they will take questions from our online audience. As you may be aware in our publicity, Nathan Fuller, acting director of the Courage Foundation based in New York, was our featured speaker. Unfortunately, due to a family health crisis, is unable to participate. So taking his place is Jeff Mackler. Jeff is the national secretary of our sister party, Socialist Action in the US. He is a lifelong organizer of civil rights, anti-war and labor solidarity. He is the West Coast coordinator of the campaign to free Mamua Abu Jamal and a steering committee member of the United National Anti-War Coalition. Jeff was also the Socialist Action candidate for president of the U.S. in 2020. In addition, Jeff is a leading member of the National Defense Campaign for Julian Assange, the jailed Australian computer programmer who founded WikiLeaks and which exposed U.S. war crimes. Welcome, Jeff. Well, Elizabeth, thank you for that introduction. You didn't mention that in the 2020 presidential election, I lost to uh, Joseph Biden for the presidency. I want your Canadian audience to understand uh, the truth that I am not yet the president of the United States. <laughs> I'm speaking for the uh, Assange Defense, <laughs> the Assange Defense Committee in the United States. It's quite a prestigious and growing committee. Its national chair people are Daniel Ellsberg, Alice Walker, and Noam Chomsky. You may remember that Daniel Ellsberg was the person who was indicted on similar charges than Assange uh, 40 some odd years ago in the 60s for revealing when he was working for the CIA, the famous Pentagon Papers, which told the truth about the US atrocity and genocidal war against the Vietnamese people a 10-year war where the U.S. slaughtered 4 million Vietnamese. <clears throat> so Dan Ellsberg is happy to join our National Defense Committee, along with Alice and Noam as co-chairs. We have chapters in a dozen cities, and we operate nationally. The speaker I'm filling in for, um, he has that had two surgeries scheduled literally today and tomorrow, uh, Nathan Fuller, is the director of the Courage Foundation, which is an international organization that defends not only Julian Assange, but whistle snorers like Edward Snowden <coughs> and uh, Chelsea Manning. It was Chelsea Manning working for a national security agency of the US government uh, who revealed the famous Iraq war logs, which tell the truth told the truth about U.S. atrocities in the Iraq war, where the United States has participated in the slaughter over the years of 1.5 million Iraqis through massive bombing, uh, open warfare, 
and through starvation sanctions. Um, the Assange Committee has been kept a bit indoors for the last year because of COVID-19. So we have been doing a series of webinar Zooms similar to yours uh, with SA Canada across the country with prominent individuals. A most recent webinar featured uh, Nathan speaking uh, for Julian Assange, along with Mumia Abu Jamal. It's Abu Jamal, Mumia Abu Jamal, Elizabeth. He has been in prison, a uh, victim of the racist prison uh, injustice system, mass incarceration system, for more than 40 years. And we're still fighting his case recently, having won a reprieve when the Supreme Court ruled of the United States that a prosecutor in a death penalty case who later becomes a Supreme Court judge can't judge the same case that he prosecuted, which was the case with Mumia. Mumia's judge, Albert Sabo, is notorious uh, as being the hanging judge and literally stated in the antechambers to his court before going into Judge Mumia, yeah, I'm going to help him fry the, and he used the N word. In any case, Julian Assange has been, until recently, in prison uh, at Belmarsh. He's been there for seven years while the British government, in conjunction with the US CIA and the Spanish government, literally installed devices to eavesdrop on every conversation that he had for seven years, violating his democratic rights. <clears throat> the government of the United States has filed charges to extradite Assange to the United States on the grounds that he violated the Espionage Act, which hasn't been enforced in the United States uh, since 1807. He'd be the first. They were unsuccessful in trying to prosecute uh, Dan Ellsberg and all others. The uh, Julian is renowned for being the editor and founder of WikiLeaks, which is the uh, internet device that uses its contacts around the world to expose the horrors of US war crimes. For example, um, one crime against humanity was Edward Snowden's um, revelations a couple of years ago, and he is in exile, unable to come back to the United States, which has a warrant out for his arrest because of the crime of revealing that the United States government and its varying spy agencies for which Edward Snowden worked for several years literally spies on every single person in the United States, if not the entire world. My God, you say, seven million people, how could you do that? And they do that because they have access through every one of the public agencies to their files, and they can install spying devices on everyone's TV and computer and watch them, their every activity, even when their television is off. They hook into the transatlantic cable and they set up spy apparatuses to spy on the, uh, the chancellor of, of uh, Germany, to the uh, head of the Brazilian government, to uh, the Nicaraguan government, not to mention all other agencies around the world. Of course, their spying is supposedly in the name of national security, but what the United States spy agencies also do is simultaneously spy on the scientific organizations of other groups to steal their, treat, their, their secrets, their patents, their methods of production, their sales information, their marketing devices, in other words, to advance the interest of U.S. imperialism. <clears throat> Our concern with Julian Assange is that he exposed the Iraq war files, including the most famous of a U.S. staffed helicopter opening fire on an innocent crowd in Iraq, murdering several journalists, including a Reuters reporter, several civilians, and others who happened to be on the scene. It was a mistake and it was covered up. 
But basically, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks revealed the remarks and cables of U.S. embassies around the world. And what came out was the United States has the most massive spy apparatus that literally denies the democratic and civil rights of everyone and spies on us 24-7, which is what Edward Snowden revealed. So the government wants to bring back Julian Assange, and they failed in their first order, where a judge, uh, a top judge, Vanessa uh, Barrister, the Raidister, ruled that he couldn't be deported on the grounds of the terrible conditions in U.S. prison would likely lead to his death or suicide. So they cited the horrendous conditions of U.S. prison, especially in a context of a government that wants Julian Assange dead, and they cited his serious health conditions, including a family history of suicide uh, attempted or committed by two of his brothers. Of course, they tried to discredit Julian Assange. They they collaborated with the Australian government to file charges, trumped up that he was a rapist. They uh, released information saying he was a Donald Trump supporter and all kinds of other slanders to discredit him, along with their disinformation and lying campaigns around the country. All of this proved to be uh, wrong. He's never been a Trump supporter, and uh, he didn't release the... Um, the Iraq war tapes to discredit the Democrats in favor of the Republicans, and all the charges against him, the spurious charges of rape have been dropped. So the question is, can an American journalist report on the truth? Can Daniel Ellsberg report on the war crimes and atrocities committed by the United States during the Vietnam War? Let's take a look what we're really looking at. The United States government maintains 1,100 military bases around the world today in some 100 nations around the planet. And it regularly organizes, orchestrates death squad assassinations, drone assassinations, private army assassinations, mercenary assassinations, not to mention overt interventions under the Obama administration the uh, U.S. government conducted seven simultaneous wars, some of them secret. And each of these wars, tens of thousands of people are murdered. The idea that a reporter from Britain, born in Australia, like Julian Assange, can report the truth of these based on the classified documents of the United States, which is what Ellsberg did, uh, and, be, and sent, be sent to jail for the rest of his life basically abrogates the fundamental right of free speech. The right not to mention the right of the American people to know the truth about what their government is doing. The United States was responsible for support to the Batista administration in Cuba prior to the 1959 revolution. That U.S.-backed government, mafia-supported government, murdered 50,000 Cubans. The U.S. supported the Batista government in Nicaragua that before its downfall at the hands of the Nicaraguan people slaughtered 80,000 people. The United States supported the overthrow of the democratically elected government of Iran in 1953 and slaughtered thousands of people, ruled that country through its dictator, the Shah, and when that dictator was overthrown with the largest mobilizations at that time in the history of the world, seven million Iranians mobilizing in the streets to drive the dictator Shah out and back to the United States, the United States retaliated by organizing an eight-year war, the Iraq-Iran War, in which the United States secretly backed the Iraqi government of Saddam Hussein in order to destroy the oil fields of both countries and to bring down the government of Iran. 
After that, the United States, under the pretext of weapons of mass destruction, promoted by the Secretary of State, the Obama administration, and all the other American officials on the grounds that the United States was, uh, that Saddam Hussein was harboring weapons of mass destruction, went to war of that country that took the lives of 1.5 million people. In other words, we're not talking about a benign uh, government. We're talking about the most vicious imperial institution in the history of the world. U.S. imperialism and the ruling class behind it, including Biden and Trump, has the reputation of supporting dictators everywhere in the world and seeking to overthrow any government that doesn't meet its standards. It's currently at war with the Syrian government, not for any uh, democratic reason, but simply because it wants control of the Middle Eastern oil, the routes from the east to the Mediterranean that pass through Syria, and Syria's own oil resources, which the United States and its occupiers, they still occupy parts of northeast and northwest Syria, control. The United States is at war with Iran and Venezuela for the simple reason that both of them are the first and second nations on earth with regard to oil facilities. So the United States organized and supported a military over coup to overthrow recently, last year, the democratically government, elected government of Venezuela, and did the same thing with the Iranian government, openly assassinating Iranian leaders who were key to defending Iran against the U.S. coup, against U.S. wars, and against U.S. instigated wars. So here we are talking about a nation, the United States, that maintains a military that is not only the largest in the world, but whose one trillion dollar annual expense exceeds the combined expenditures of virtually the entire world, or at least the top 10 imperial nations on earth and that money bipartisanly allocated is used to expand and defend u.s capitalist interests the world over through open intervention wars sanction wars death squad wars drone wars like they use in pakistan and currently finishing its 20-year war against the afghan people who never attacked the United States in the first place. In 19, uh, in 9-1-1-2001, the United States said to the Afghan government that they had to turn over the Osama bin Laden character, who they said was responsible for leading the attack on the World Trade Center. But the Afghan government had absolutely no knowledge of or obligation uh, of where uh, to turn over anyone to the U.S. So the United States went to war, and 21 years later, tens and hundreds of thousands of Afghan people have been killed, not to mention the U.S. NATO forces that continue to bomb that country to smithereens. The United States has basically established a pro-U.S. government. Why are they there? For trade routes, on the one hand. It just happens peripherally that Afghanistan is the first or second in the world in its uh, lithium reserves, a rare earth metal that is central to the production of transistors. So the U.S. imperial beast is interested not in democracy in Afghanistan. It supported a basic dictatorship there and virtually every other country that it invades, none of them uh, have established democratic rights. All of them are invaded, attacked, embargoed, or sanctioned in order to defend the interests of the imperial monster, the United States. Our committee, AssangeDefense.org and the Courage Foundation, defends Julian's right to tell the truth, the right to free speech, the right to publish the truth about U.S. atrocities. And the response of the United States has always been that you don't have that right in the U.S. democracy that they conceive of, democratic rights, civil liberties, the First Amendment, free speech, free association, a free press, are subordinate 
to what the government defines as the, quote, national security interests of the United States government. And the interest of national security, the government says that they can control the media, they can censor the, uh, the corporate press, which doesn't need much censorship, as the major newspapers in the United States, the papers of record, usually have enough embedded CIA agents to make sure that the line of the government and the CIA is the line we hear. For example, during the Iraq war, there was not a single newspaper in the country that refuted the U.S. furious charge that the Saddam Hussein government was manufacturing weapons of mass destruction that were going to be used imminently by the Saddam Hussein government. Well, subsequently, all the UN inspectors and others who searched Iran up and down never found a weapon of mass destruction. But that country was bombed into smithereens. Similarly, the United States argued that they had to saturation bomb Libya because they claimed that the Gaddafi government was set imminently to murder 50,000 protesters in Benghazi. And yet the British military secret service refuted that and saying there never was any threat of imminent attack by the Gaddafi government. And yet the United States orchestrated a massive saturation bombing that destroyed the virtual infrastructure of that country and left it a failed state replete with warring factions fighting to divide up the oil in that country. The United States conducted a war of genocide, and in Syria, and in Yemen today, and in Vietnam yesterday, and in Cuba, and in Latin America, and in Venezuela, and in Iran. The nations are unbelievable. In the last hundred years, the United States has orchestrated 700 interventions, none in the name of democracy, none in the name of democratic rights, all in the name of securing the interests of U.S. imperial ruling classes, financial, economic, military, and natural resource reasons. So defending Julian Assange has many edges, and I'll close on this. The first and foremost is a simple idea that a journalist has the right to tell the truth. It's the simple idea of a free press, which doesn't exist in corporate America, where the major newspapers are dominated by the corporate elite and owned by the corporate elite. The same corporations that own the oil, the same corporations that run the government, own the major corporations that determine the media. So there is no free speech. We're going to free Julian Assange only if we build the kind of massive, independent, united front mobilizations of the American people and the world's people to say no. No to U.S. wars and interventions. Hands off. U.S. out now. Free speech for journalists. What's the state of the case today with Julian Assange? It's very simple. The United States has lost to everybody under the Trump administration. So everybody with bated breath wondered whether or not the new Biden administration was going to appeal the case. We got constitutional lawyers and friends of Democratic of democratic and civil rights around the country to say to Biden, no, support free speech, leave Julian Assange alone. But just recently, the Biden administration has announced its intent to appeal its loss in court, to override the decision. By the way, the judge in the British court did only rule that you couldn't extradite Julian Assange because it would lead to likely lead to his death. But it did not support any of Assange's lawyers and his own defense of democratic rights and civil liberties. The British, accord, the British courts were in total accord with the position of the United States that democratic rights, free speech, a free press, and a journalist right to print the truth had no standing in British courts, as they have none in America. 30 seconds. The right of free speech has never given to anyone. It was won in struggle 
from the time of the American Revolution. It wasn't part of the original Constitution. It had to be added to the Bill of Rights of the Constitution. And it had to be fought for every day since it became enshrined in U.S. law to today, where progressives, radicals, liberals, and people who believe in human rights and free speech and social uh, equality have to fight for every gain, whether it be against the reactionary prison industrial complex, the murdering police state, murders that are daily in the United States, in fact, every three days, and the basic right to tell the truth. I'm honored to be with you today. I look forward to today's discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Our, our panelist now is John Anderson. He's an out and proud communist who is organizing in Toronto. He posts political commentary on his YouTube channel, The Canadian Commie, and you can find his content on thecanadiancommie.com, as well as a weekly podcast at thesocialistagenda.com. Welcome, John. Oh, thank you for having me. I got to do this without the video or else my connection goes all wonky. So no, you, you don't get to see my beautiful face today, unfortunately. Okay. Uh, I mean, what, what, what can be said about this? This is, this is the, the Julian Assange situation, in my view, is proof positive that the United States has gone full-blown like rogue state, right? It doesn't respond to international norms. It doesn't respond to uh, uh, crit critiques or critics from outside. Here is uh, a, a, an American who is attempting to do journalism in his own, about, about an issue that is very important for Americans to know about, which is the actions of their own military as they embark in a, a, a military adventurism all over the world. And he's been locked in a room for it. We, we, we have all gone through a pandemic here and we're all losing our minds and complaining about how we've been uh, having to be locked uh, away and we can't go outside and we can't do anything. Well, now imagine that you're locked in that room and you have to stay there. And all because the, the gentleman just wanted to, to let people know what the United States military has been doing. And like the amount of propaganda that has swirled around Julian Assange is astounding. Like they, they've made full scale movies in order to demonize this figure. Like they, they have contacted Hollywood people. I, I believe uh, um, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch plays him in one of these films where they essentially try to smear his name. This is the degree that they are going to go uh, uh, after these types of journalists. And even more terrifying than any of this, there is almost complete media silence in the media landscape about Julian Assange, which if you were a journalist working in America, you would think this is the first story that should be talked about every single night until the, the, the night that he's released. It's, it, it's a staggering story. And I hope from the bottom of my heart to the, to the top of my head that uh, somebody in America finally does the right thing and they finally free Julian Assange. Elizabeth, you're muted. Sorry about that. Our next speaker is Corey David. He is a machinist, a post guitar player, and a land back movement supporter. Corey was the socialist action candidate in the recent Scarborough Agent Court City Council by election held in January 2021. Welcome, Corey. Corey, you're muted. No, uh, mute yourself on your computer, Corey. Okay, I'm just gonna try it like this. I mean, 
the no, we can hear you. the sound might not be the greatest. I don't know. Um, but I just wanted to say that I, I'm, I'm very glad to be here. The, the, um, the free Assange movement is very important to me. Um, I've been following it for a long time. I mean, uh, repression of any journalist is obviously um, an attack on us all, an attack on our democracy, um, whatever democracy exists, I guess, that we have. Um, and it's an attack on our freedom, our freedom to access information about, about the world around us and about what the people we put into power, supposedly we put into power, are doing, or the people that have taken power for themselves. Um, what is, what is this, this um, these over 10 years, in 2010 is when those Chelsea Manning um, leaks came out through WikiLeaks and the same year that the, um, the U.S. State Department issued the warrant um, or issued the, uh, the espionage charge against and the extradition charge against Assange. So he's, he applied for um, basically sanctuary from political persecution in the Ecuadorian embassy at that time. Uh, he spent, I think, uh, seven or eight, when did he get pulled out of there by the police when, um, when he lost favor with the Ecuadorian uh, uh, government? I don't know, a couple of years ago, right? So now he's basically being tortured. I mean, he was, he was basically in prison there. He couldn't go anywhere, even though he sort of had the freedom of movement and some, I guess, um, um, I don't know, not <laughs> terrible conditions, I guess, like a prison condition. But now he's pretty much being tortured, being isolated. I mean, his health is completely degenerated. Um, this is this is what the U.S. Is, is trying to do. The U.S. and I should say the Western Empire, not just the U.S. But this is what they're trying to do. It's like it's like the mob. When 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 someone tries to expose the mob um, or any organized crime, um, they're they're silenced and punished. You know, to set an example, so that that others will not look to to raise their heads um, in opposition to the crimes that these um, <laughs> that this empire is committing. Um, so th they're torturing him, and they, if they can't extradite him, it looks like they're going to try and kill him. I mean, that's that's what it looks like could happen to him in, in, in Belmarsh, which is a notoriously terrible prison. Not that any prisons are good. Um, anyways, I, I wanted to touch on uh, a couple things. I know we're here to talk about freeing Assange, which is it's very important, but it's tied to the larger issue of um, of making sure journal journalists everywhere have have freedom of expression and um, and freedom of speech, and we stand that we stand up for them. So, I mean, the U.S. empire is, um, of course, the, the U.S. Western empire is, is the biggest threat, I think, to humanity um, that has ever existed on this planet. It kills people every day. Um, it drone strikes. It, it, as Jeff Mackler said, it, it launches um, black site um, assassinations. Um, and it gets other nations to do its dirty work for it as well. I mean, and I think that's part of what's going on here as well is, is in Syria, not just about the resources in Afghanistan, Iraq, all over the Middle East, all over Africa. I mean, resources are huge. That's wealth, right? That's that's where you get your money. Um, I can't remember who it was, but, but you, they said uh, a, a great socialist said, you don't go into, into poor countries to make money. You go into rich countries to make money. And that's that's what they're doing. Um, and they don't want to get caught doing it. They're saying they're going there to protect people. But it's it's plain to see because of people like Assange, because of other journalists that, that speak freely, that, 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 um, that, um, that the, the, they'll be repressed if, if they if they talk out about this. That, that, the, sorry, that this is what's going on. That they're stealing resources and they're taking up land. But it's not just about resources. Sorry, is what I wanted to say. It's also about geopolitical control. The United States declared itself that it wants to have total domination over the over the world militarily. Um, that's why it's looking to militarize space more and more every day. Um, that's why it's looking to <laughs> militarize or propagandize information everywhere. Um, looking. Looking at the North America from, from my position, I mean, I'm in Canada and Scarborough, um, but there's a, a lot of repression of, um, uh, and there's a lot of restriction on information. If you look at the news and stuff, they, they won't talk about things. Even even leftist news or, or so-called progressive news, um, you know, they won't, they, they didn't want to talk about when, when, the, when some of the um, inspectors in, in Syria um, disputed the, um, the international inquiry into the gas attacks in Duma, when some of the inspectors, um, disputed that they they shut it up and they they said this is our report and they wouldn't they wouldn't give them the floor there were, there were several irish inspectors that, that spoke out um about, about what was happening and about how they, they weren't being listened to they were being totally ignored um by 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 their the the un the un body that uh, oversaw the uh, investigation um seemingly at the behest of, of u.s empire to to give them more justification for for more, greater conflict and greater intervention in the region um, I mean, so so this is this is um, this is a long term strategy of the U.S. As, as Jeff said, they have over um, ten thousand bases around the world. Some of these are quite small bases, but it's just it's just their foot in the door, so that if they need to to act or operate anywhere, they can do so. They can listen in on any conversation. 
I mean, the, the, the you see the media report that the Russian planes guide U.S. planes away from the border or they move to intersect them in, in, in Ukraine when the U.S. planes are flying in international waters over the Mediterranean or the Baltic or, or, or whatever. But what, what they don't tell you is that the U.S. planes are actually listening in on, on communications from, from Russian military, um, from, um, from Russian intelligence. They don't, they don't tell you that that's what they're doing in the sky. They're not just going for a nice ride and they're not just checking up on what the Russians are doing on their border. They have satellites for that, but they have high tech uh, communications um, um, sensor equipment on these planes and they fly close to the, the Russian border to figure out what they're doing, you know? And, and, and so they can, they can keep an eye on them and they can keep them under control. I mean, and, and this is this is sort of what I wanted to get to with my with my second point is is campism. I mean, we Julian Assange played is is a great journalist in the sense that he didn't he's not in a camp like Edward Snowden. He's not like like um like Eva Bartlett or like some of these other journalists who who do do good reporting in a lot of ways. But you can tell that there's a lot of bias that they're that they're supported by either either governments or or or, or media bodies um, of governments. Um, to report on this and it's 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 certainly anti-us but but often it's it's very pro um very pro uh the 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 the, the adversary or the the other opposing nation like syria or north korea or russia or or um or venezuela or a, a, any any of these places right and i mean i'm i i i'm all for venezuelan solidarity i mean no intervention anywhere um but we have to be careful about falling into these campus views a big, a big discussion now I see on uh, among socialists and, and the left in general is about China and the, and the Uyghur situation there. And there's, there's no question in my mind, based on even Chinese reporting, that there is a, a human rights abuses going on there. Um, that there is a sort of what appears to me to be so, a sort of form of colonization going on. Um, but, but to to look at what the U.S. is pushing and what the what the Canadian government is pushing and what the West in general is pushing, calling it genocide right out the door. I mean, and it may even amount to genocide, but um, but I'm not saying that it does because I haven't seen reporting that corroborates that, at least not enough reporting. Um, but but if, if that's what they're after, then they can look no further than Israel, Palestine or, or, or a score of other nations where, where, where ethnic cleansing is going on. Uh, Myanmar is, is a recent example, right? So so you can clearly see that, that they, they, they don't, they don't stand up for rights. They stand up for their interests, um, and and they go after those people who try to deny them their interests, especially individuals who don't have the the backing of, of a state like Julian Assange. Um, so so I thank Julian for for what I would say is his sacrifice, although I don't think he meant to make it. Um, but 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 um, but he he stood there and 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 he's the enemy of of many very powerful people because he he, um, he doesn't care. It seems. I mean, he's not a socialist, as far as I know, but but he he, he cares very deeply. It appears, at least, um, for the truth, and 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 is very bothered by by what um, Western Empire and 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 very and powerful geopolitical geopolitical powers and possibly other empires, <clears throat> um, depending how you, how you see it. Um, you know, he didn't he didn't care about the, the um, what was going to happen to him. You know, uh, I mean, and this is the thing too. We we have these things only because of um, because of these reporters, um, and 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 they, they take a lot of hit. Glenn Greenwald in, in in Venezuela did a lot of reporting, and he took a lot of hits from um, from big media corporations who, who just want to push their own narrative, right? So so um, I mean I, I stand in solidarity with Julian Assange. And I, I thank him for what he did, and I really hope that he he finds justice and that, and that we get him free, we get him out of jail, and that we get all the political prisoners and, and journalists that, that that face repression in in every country in the world, um, that we get them free. Um, but it's a long struggle, and I think as socialists, um, one of our core tactics or, or principles, at least, is is we have to confront the um, the oppressor at home, and and so as as much as I say we have to watch out for campism and stuff, um, we have to address our own ruling class first. Before we start pointing fingers around the world at other at other um, other atrocities and other other bad actors and ruling powers that you know want 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 to um, remain in power and, and remain in control and um, and so we have to confront you know here in Canada the Canadian government and the Canadian media which pushes its narrative which selects what stories it pushes which um, selects its sources and, and often source and I wanted to say earlier that that, that that I agree with Jeff that a lot of the sourcing uh, through, through for the mainstream media for CNN all came from um, government sources in or military sources in, in the region. 
So there was, there was no free press at all when, when they invaded Iraq. And, and, um, and, and, and this goes on today, that, that many, many sources being cited in the news are just government, government parties. So how is that, how is that free and, and, and unbiased? I mean, it's not. Anyways, um, I'll wrap up here and look forward to the discussion ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Okay, so thank you to all of our speakers. Now we will go to our uh, producer uh, to put up the first three questions in the chat. Corey. Kurt? Okay, so our first question comes from myself, and I asked, what actions can we t uh, take to help free Julian Assange from Belmarsh Prison? Our next question comes from Dana with Franklin, who asks, which countries, if any, have expressed official support for Julian? And Julius asks, what consequences will come about if the U.S. is successful in extraditing Julian Assange? Okay, so our speakers uh, each have up to uh, six minutes to answer the questions. And we will start with Corey, then Jeff, then John. Corey? You're muted, Corey. I tried to use my microphone again. I guess it's not going to work. Um, so, so to what actions can we take to help Julian Assange? Well, I think that we can get involved with the organizations that are that are um, doing solidarity work with Julian Assange. But I, I think probably the most powerful thing that, that the, the the broad public can do is just sort of keep keep the story alive. I mean, and 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 stay on the facts because there's as we've discussed, there's a lot of um, dissemination of of of, of, of slander or what have you like i'm not going to say whether julian assange ass sexually assaulted a, the, the, that woman in sweden i mean but even the swedish prosecutor wanted to drop the charges because um the amount of uh, effort going into it was just ridiculous for for those for those charges i mean of course every, everything should be taken seriously but you're having international interpol go after this guy for um for sexual assault charges right so i mean i i'm not going to say whether he's innocent or not i mean that's that's it was never taken to court they actually dropped the charges so so, so regardless of that, but 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 tons of slander and 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 and, and manufacturing of stories is pushed out by the media about about Assange and about you know and anybody who's who's looking to um to confront um th their narrative or the narrative they're pushing. So I mean we can do, we have disseminate the information, our information, and and make sure that that your friends and family know um what you're about and and that this is not okay. I mean it's a great lead in to talk about Western Empire and the way it operates. I mean, I think to, to some degree, like, especially like no, no one in, in, in like people that I've met, no one refutes Assange, no one refutes the Paradise Papers, right? We, we, we know this stuff is happening, whether it's, it's on paper or not, because we see it all around us. Um, we always hear about, about shell companies in, 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 in Panama or, or anywhere, right? Doing these things. And, and so I think we just have to make sure that we keep pushing people to give us the, the truth, right? To, to call for the truth and to call for justice. And, and, and I mean, Barry has a question later about mass movements, but yeah, we have to get the masses behind this to, to push our government to put, well, to actually, you know, to, to push our government away because they're the ones who are organizing this at the behest of great capitalists and the ruling class. So we, we have to, we have to build a movement against it. And so that's what I think that's one of the best things I think we can do is just try to build that movement and try to make sure that we're speaking the truth and that we know that, that, that we, we have the, the best information um, available to us to, um, to, to defend um, to defend uh, what, what we know to, to be right in, in, in this case and with Julian Assange and the, the free press that's my position on that um, Dinner and Franklin I don't I don't know which which nations um, are, are sympathetic to Julian Assange I know there's a fairly large movement in Australia because he, he's he is Australian um, uh, to um, to support him there's been several I think uh, officials um, that have come out in support of him like government officials I, I mean um ecuador obviously was the president of ecuador was sympathetic towards him that's why he gave him uh, amnesty inside the um the consulate at the embassy um I, I don't know beyond that um like i said he's gone after many different um states and nations and individuals um government officials and whatnot so like he doesn't he's not out there to make friends and so i don't think that anyone is really with any any state has really backed him at least entirely officially 
Um, but there definitely have been people, individuals within those governments who have, who have stood up for him. So I, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly about that other than what I've said. And, and, as, and in terms of consequences, if Julian is extradited to the States, well, it will set a pretty terrible precedent if, um, if Assange is, is extradited to um, America to face trial for espionage. I mean, it will basically tell, tell us that we can't question um, our governments, um, especially U.S. empire, that we can't, um, that, we, um, that we don't have a right to know what's going on, that that's uh, beyond our pay grade, that that's, that's above us, that that's up for other people to decide you know, in our so-called democracy. So I, I think those are some, some, some big um, questions that are gonna be answered, I guess, soon, if, uh, if Assange gets extradited or not. Um, because already all around the world, like, like every state seems to become more repressive towards media. Um, every state, Egypt is, is one of the worst. I know they, they constantly have um, media from like Al Jazeera, um, and, and other news agencies in, in prison for, for the reporting they're doing there. Um, and, 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 and the U.S. Is, is helping around the world. I mean, and maybe other powerful states are as well, but I know the U.S. is helping around the world um, with censorship, with security, these kinds of things, because it helps them. If they can make a country more restrictive and harder for, um, and harder for the people to have access to, to, to the information and, and harder for the people to, um, to confront their government. Um, um, the more barriers that are put up there, it, it helps the U.S., you know, if those, if those governments are friendly towards the U.S. Um, so, yeah. And, anyways, that, that's all I'll say. I have to wrap up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Corey. Jeff? Well, these are good questions. Uh, and the answers can be very simple or complicated. But let's take the question of what actions can we take to help Julian? Um, what, actions, what actions can we take to expose the fact that the US is a nation that practices systemic racism against black people, that kills murders by police, three unarmed people, half black and Native American and Latino, every day of the week. I could give you an abstract answer for that. But when 20 million Americans last summer mobilized in the streets to say Black Lives Matter and to demand justice for the police murder of George Floyd by cop Derek Chauvin, things changed very quickly. For the first time in my life, <clears throat> and I've been around for 81 years, I saw a demonstration that was the largest in the history of the country and one of the largest in the history of the world. 21 million people said that this nation reeks with systemic racism against blacks, that the cop murderers are never prosecuted, that the United States maintains more people on death row and in prison as a percentage of its population in absolute numbers than any nation on earth. But when 20 million people came into the streets and Trump said to his generals, let's certify, invoke the Insurrection Act, call out the army, and repress these demonstrators who are breaking windows, his generals turned around and said no. He couldn't call out the army to cancel the elections, although he wanted to. And overnight, literally, the statues of the racist Confederate leaders were torn down or taken down by the government. Overnight, the Congress of the United States had to remove the portraits from the halls of Congress of the open racist slavocracy that were still honored in this country. After 200 years in one summer, more was done than in 200 years combined. That's because they were afraid that the American people would get out of hand, would question the nature of the state, would say there is no justice in society. 
So the ruling class, not Donald Trump, pulled back and said, no, we're not going to arrest more people. We're not going to call out the army to shoot, kill, murder, stun, maim, explosion, grenade. Uh, the, the 20 million people in 2,000 cities that mobilized. It's the same thing with Julian Assange. In fact, it's the history of the United States that every single progressive change ever was a result of mass movements. There were no labor unions allowed until workers insisted and broke every law in the book to demand that labor have the right to form a union. There was no civil rights gains in this country until there was a civil war that defeated the slaveocracy and the slaveocracy in a bipartisan agreement was returned in this country, only to be challenged initially <clears throat> when a massive civil rights movement defied the laws, won over a new generation. I grew up in the McCarthy era. First thing I ever did as a young person was stand at a bus stop in Queens, New York, and circulate a petition as a 13-year-old boy for Julius and Ethel Rosenberg who the United States was about to execute on the grounds that they gave the Russians the secret to the atomic bomb. Here, the Russians couldn't have the secret to the atomic bomb, and yet, five, eight years earlier, the United States dropped two atomic bombs on the innocent civilians in 1945 of the Japanese people of Nagasaki and Hiroshima, even after the government had surrendered and agreed to the United States terms of defeat. They instantly incinerated 250,000 people in each of those cities. And yet they proclaimed as a civilized nation that the Russians couldn't have the bomb. They went to war in Korea and slaughtered 2 million North Koreans on the grounds that they wanted to control the northern part of the peninsula previously occupied by the Japanese. And the Koreans fought back and defeated the United States, developed their own bomb. And today the United States says the Koreans are uncivilized, that the Korean leader is an insane young person. The United States, with tens of thousands of nuclear weapons, insists that Korea can't have one. The United States embargoes and starves to death and ruins the economy of Iran because the Iranians want the right, even though they said they're not doing it, to use its nuclear facilities to develop nuclear energy so when its oil runs out, it can use it. In other words, the history of all previous societies is a history of social change being won and struggle by mass independent movements. That brings us to Joseph Biden. Did he make any changes? He still refuses to recognize the Cuban government. And by the way, in answer to the question, how many governments support the freedom of Julian Assange? Corey's right, we don't have a count. I'm sure there are several. But even if every government on earth made a decision against the imperial United States, what do you think the result would be? Sounds like a stupid question, but we have an answer. Every government in the world has denounced the illegal sanctions of Cuba in the United Nations, except the United States and Israel. And yet the illegal sanctions continues. The U.S. ruling class doesn't give a damn about the opinions of the people of the world. What it counts on, what it does concern itself with, is the formation of independent mass mobilizations and even more so when they're led by revolutionary socialist parties, whose objective is to establish for the first time in their nations, like you're trying to do in Canada, a socialist society based on majority rule. That's all socialism is. It's the rule of the vast working class majority, as opposed to the capitalist few. That's 30 seconds. That's why we're on this program. So you can defend Julian Assange. Go to assangedefense.org. You can sign a million petitions. 
Start your own committee in Canada. We'll help you and collaborate with you. Build the mass movements for social justice against imperialist wars. And most important, build the revolutionary socialist parties. We seek to build mass revolutionary parties, democratic parties, parties that urge united front mass mobilizations to defend the interests of the press, parties that are deeply rooted in every struggle for humanity. Building those parties is the best way to freely free Julian Assange, to end imperialist war, to establish democratic and rights and civil liberties for everyone. And finally, the consequences of not freeing Julian Assange will likely be his death in prison. He's not a well man, and even a conservative judge said, if he's deported to the United States, he will likely die. Okay, thank you, Jeff. John? Okay, I'm gonna try the camera here, but please let me know if I start to have any connectivity issues, okay? I seem to be having some connectivity issues. Um, uh, I, I mean, what, what, what actions can be taken? We just need to keep talking about it. It's as simple as that, organize and talk about it. Uh, we are really in a position with Julian Assange where we are no longer fighting for his life. We are fighting for the message and we are fighting for the truth that Julian Assange will be a martyr of this cause. He already is a martyr of this cause. Even if he was released today, like the amount of torture and the amount of strife that he has been put under for simply telling the truth about what has happened uh, in the world is uh, enough for him to be considered uh, a martyr to uh, the cause of the truth generally. Um, what countries have expressed official support? I have no idea. <laughs> Sorry. But the, the, the one I'm most, uh, uh, the question I'm most interested in talking about is what consequences will come about. Yeah, he'll be killed for sure. Like that's, uh, uh, but what it will be is yet another um, signal to the world that the United States does what it wants. And it doesn't need your permission. It doesn't need, uh, it's not interested in negotiating on the world stage. It's not interested in communicating on the world stage. Uh, it has an entire, pro like, like one of the things that I say all of the time on my channel is, uh, the capitalists are only really good at one thing and that's propaganda and the level of propaganda that they will level against their own people in regards to Julian Assange in order to keep their own people in line with the idea that it is perfectly acceptable what they have done to this man when while simultaneously holding up and lauding and idealizing concepts like freedom of speech, right? Uh, and the amount of propaganda that is going to be pushed on the American people is going to be really intense uh, if, if we actually continue talking about it and if we actually continue shining light on, on it and if we actually make it, uh, get it to a point where people actually need to respond to it because otherwise they'll simply ignore it, right? Otherwise they'll just simply ignore it and Julian Assange will die in a prison. And uh, the end result of all of this, what comes, um, I mean, it, it, this is just yet another domino on the ever falling domino train that the United States finds itself upon where uh, it is steadily becoming more and more isolated on the world stage right? That uh, if you have a room full of people and one of them is a raving psychopath that stabs people and robs them whenever he feels like, uh, you don't want to talk to that guy, right? You're certainly not going to open trade negotiations with that guy. Uh, and it is going to come, there will be a point, certainly in my lifetime, where the United States is simply going to begin ruling more openly about this. We had a little taste of that with uh, with Donald Trump. The, the Democrats and Joe Biden have the political wherewithal to pretend as though they are not this raving psychopath over in the corner who just kills people whenever he wants and steals their stuff. Um, and, but there is going to come a point where the the Bidens and the Clintons and this group of people will be dead. And 
they're going to look at the idea of, well, why do we need to pretend any longer? Why do we need to walk around and pretend as though we are not simply the rulers of this pathetic gentry, right? And it will become more and more obvious as time goes on that, uh, and this is this this is historically the case that uh, whenever a nation takes to being a warlike culture, whether it's the Romans, the Byzantines, whether it's any of this, they do eventually turn around and inflict on themselves what they have been inflicting on the rest of the world. Uh, and I take a look at a figure like Julius Assange, or Ju Julius Assange, Julian Assange, and uh, and I see him uh, more as an icon of a revolution, something that we should hold up constantly. Like whenever I talk to Nazis, I just say Diedrich Bonhoeffer, right? I, uh, I don't argue with them. I don't create points. I don't try to say anything to these people uh, except Diedrich Bonhoeffer. Because if you go and look at Diedrich Bonhoeffer, you'll find a highly religious man who stood up against the Nazis and was executed for it. Think very much we're going to find the same thing with Julian Assange, that we should keep him alive. Uh, we should keep him alive through our literature. We should keep him alive through our iconography. We should keep him alive through pictures. We should keep him alive through quotes. Uh, because <laughs> he isn't going to be alive for much longer, one way or the other. And so we need to keep him alive in our movement so that when we finally do get the numbers to confront capital, which is the end game of all of this, <laughs> that we will be able to shove in their faces the names just like Diedrich Bonhoeffer of Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning. Thank you very much, John. Okay, so back to our producer, Kurt, for the second round, three questions. Kurt, over to you. Okay, so our first question comes from uh, Barry Wiseletter. Barry Wiseletter asks, in a situation where free speech and freedom of press are increasingly attacked and minimized in the West, to what extent should we rely on the courts and lawyers? Would mass protest action be more reliable, just like the movement that stopped the war in Vietnam? And that is demanding today uh, that the police be defunded, disarmed, and disbanded. Justin Reinke asks, what role has Canada played in the propaganda of and legal proceedings against Julian Assange? To what extent has Canada acted as an arm of the U.S. in all of this? And I ask, we, should, uh, we see a consolidation of news outlets and mass censorship on social media. Now the Canadian government is putting forward laws to regulate user-generated content online. How can we fight back against the draconian actions of silent dissident, uh, dissident voices? Okay, so we'll go back to our panelists. You have up to five minutes to answer one or all questions. And our first speaker will be Jeff, then John, then Corey. So please, everybody keep within their five minutes. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for your questions, friends and comrades. In answer to Barry Weisletter's question, yes, it's necessary to organize with lawyers and fight in the courts. That's one institution that we have, and our objective is not to sit back, do nothing, and rely on lawyers, but as we are doing in AssangeDefense.org, we are taking the case to the people. So we are arguing the legal issues in court and around the world and simultaneously plan to mobilize mass mobilizations to defend Julian. So for example, we're going back into the streets in the United States in the next couple of months as soon as we get a respite from COVID-19. And we have planned a mass rally in the San Francisco Bay Area 
with Alice Walker, Angela Davis, Boots Riley, Umia Abu Jamal, live from prison, Robbie Mirpool, the son of the Rosenbergs, and a host of others, Daniel Ellsberg, Michael Franti, the, uh, the radical folk singer, reggae style, who are going to have a rally. We're going to raise tens of thousands of dollars, and we'll have five or six or seven hundred people. And then we'll have an outdoor rally. You know, this Labor Day, this May Day, just a few days ago, in the San Francisco Bay Area, the Labor Council of San Francisco, the AFL-CIO affiliate, organized a May Day demonstration. It was the first time many of us have been in the streets. And it was quite interesting. 1,500 people marched up Market Street to the, uh, from the Embarcadero to the Civic Center, the historic route pioneered by the International Longshore and Warehouse Union in 1936 when they organized a general strike that closed down the city, won their demands, and made San Francisco and Northern California a union town. And guess what the lead banner carried by the Longshore Union was? Free Mumia Abu Jamal. We're the city that not long ago had 25,000 in the streets to free Mumia. We beat back two government efforts to execute Mumia. We kept this fight alive and Mumia alive. And Mumia just emerged from open heart surgery last week. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to chain him during the surgery to the operating room table. And we beat that back too. So the answer to Barry's vital question is, the struggle is at every level. Trying to break through the corporate media, trying to get them to tell the truth. The Vietnam era that our party, Socialist Action, and its predecessors in the United States, and the same with Canada, the mass movement that we organized to stop the Vietnam War, broke through the constrictions of the McCarthy era. Their free speech was subordinate to the national security interests of the United States. The McCarthy era laws, the national security laws, were set aside by the Supreme Court that was frightened when millions of people mobilized in the streets in defiance of injunction to say, bring the troops home now. That's the same with every social movement. Building these movements is absolutely critical. As far as the other question on the news outlets and uh, regulations, we're seeing increasingly in the United States the power of the social media to totally dominate the media. We had Trump talking to four billion people every day, and the United States government with Twitter and uh, Facebook beginning to censor the social movements, saying the government determines that uh, your, your information is not true. Our anti-war social justice information, precisely the information that Julian Assange tried to put forward, and we in his footsteps. So there's a battle for free speech in the United States. It's not only over censorship. It's a battle to establish our own media, our own movement newspapers, that we put in the hands of working people in the factories, at the point of production, and in the streets, that we talk to people day in and day out who have no interest in promoting the racism that is inherent in the capitalist system, whether it be in Canada or the United States. So once again, it goes back to the essentials. Build a revolutionary party. It's not a party of crazy people. It's a party of working people who every day Go to work because they have to work in order to survive. And of course, the capitalists extract surplus value that makes them rich. That's what the system of capitalism is all about. The appropriation of working people's labor in the interest of the rich. I just read a book by Aaron Dottie Roy, and she said that one individual in India, a multi-billionaire, owns as much wealth as half of the Indian population of 1.3 billion people. The statistics are not different. We just lost a collective bargaining fight in the United States when Jeff Bezos, the second richest person on the planet Earth, 30 was, seconds. 
worth $180 billion and heading up the Amazon Corporation beat back a tragically inadequate union drive in Bessemer, uh, Bessemer Alabama. By, uh, his company is worth $1.3 trillion. And he won because the labor movement is weak and pathetic and disorganized in the United States. We have to build that labor movement. You have the starting point. You have an opposition caucus in the NDP. We in the United States don't even have anything resembling a labor party that worked with people based on their own unions from control. So get involved. Join us in the struggle. Join Socialist Action Canada and ask your friends to join us in the United States. Thank you, Jeff. John? All right, I'm going to keep the video off this time because I got told uh, it was cutting out a bit. So uh, I'm going to start with what role has Canada played? Uh, Canada is America's whipping boy. Any other position is ridiculous. Uh, Canada, like, uh, we're standing in that room and there's that psychopath that's killing everybody. That guy lives beside us. And it's very, very clear that Canada's position in regards to dealing with the United States has always been and will always remain uh, well, if he's attacking someone else, he's not attacking me. Uh, and uh, uh, so what is our role in this Julian Assange thing? America's going to do what it's going to do, and we're going to buddy up. If it says jump, we're going to say how high, and we're going to do exactly what it tells us to do, because that's exactly who we are. It's a survival strategy, and we're doing it very, very well. Um, to what extent should we trust the courts? Our court system is actually very strong. But it is it like Canada is the whipping boy of the United States. The courts are the whipping boy of the uh, leadership and the and the power that is currently in Parliament. Right? They if you try to go to court to stand up against the government on let's say climate change issues or uh, uh, some kind of larger uh, issue, they will just throw you out because they'll say you don't have standing. And so trying to go through the courts in order to find a resolution while you're fighting against the ruling class who are currently in power uh, is not going to work. The, the courts respond very well uh, when you are the ruling class or when you are at least in opposition. Uh, but if you are independent of those things, the courts are probably not going to help you out. And this all flows down to uh, even Kurt's question here, uh, uh, the only option we have left as a people is a general strike. We have no alternative left. The ruling class does not care what we say, right? This is the reason why they are not going to censor us actively. This is the reason why they are not going to remove us from YouTube or do any of this kind of stuff, ultimately, because they don't care what we say. We can go and have our YouTube uh, webcasts and we can talk uh, all we want. We can say what we want. We can go to the pubs and the bars and we can complain as loudly as we want. And in fact, they may even encourage that. Let the rabble blow steam off complaining. They don't care what we say. They care what we do. And they're not going to do anything about anything until we actually get into the streets and take their cities over and tell them that we are not working for them anymore. And if those are not it, like we should no longer be negotiating with these people. It's as simple as that. We should no longer be treating what we are doing with these people as a negotiation at all. The game is over. They have lost. They no longer get to participate. We are going to restructure this thing without them. Uh, because what they are doing is obviously psychotic. Like, it's insane what they're pursuing. It's insane the journey that they're on. And moreover than any of this, active strikes and active uh, protests on the streets work. It, they work quick, and they're the most efficient way to get anything done. And I know this is true because... Literally the day before the climate change protests happened here in Toronto, the liberals were sitting around doing absolutely nothing about the climate change issue. No one was saying word one, right? And then 100,000 people suddenly showed up in Toronto and said, hey, this climate change thing is maybe something we should move on. 
Justin Trudeau showed up and had a nice little photo op for us to be like, hey, aren't you the prime minister? What the hell are you doing here? Maybe do something. And then the liberals, what did they do? They declared a climate emergency shortly thereafter and then did nothing else. But what it showed is it showed that it scared the hell out of these guys. It showed that if you get 100,000 people on the streets demanding some kind of change, they'll actually respond to it. And if you uh, uh, want to see change in your communities, if you want to see change in your society, you know what you got to do? You got to get everybody together and you've got to organize a general strike. We have no other solution left. Okay, thank you very much, Corey. Okay. Like I'm still not working. All right. Um, so I, I, I mean, I, I agree with John that um, that direct action is necessary. But I just want to say that um, that it's not like it, it may even happen spontaneous, right? That's that's usually the way a, a lot of large demonstrations and, and, and strikes happen. Um, but we we don't know when it's going to happen. I mean, and John made an appeal, and Jeff made an appeal, and I'm making an appeal for for everyone listening and everyone who who who, who hears us to get involved um, in in the movement to um, to fight capitalism. Um, but, but we, we can't just, it's not just going to happen. We need to build it. We need to convince people. I mean, people aren't stupid. They know what's going on and they know they're being exploited. Um, but they're worried about what's going to happen because as, as we've discussed, there's all kinds of repression. There's all kinds of reactionary, um, things that can happen. I mean, people are, people in any kind of revolutionary situation, any strike are going to get hurt, are going to get arrested, are going to be harassed and violent and violently, um, persecuted. Um, you know, it, if, if it's not successful, which which it's it's hard to have a success. I mean, Jeff talked about how disorganized and and um, and, and the, the state of basically the labor movement in the U.S. and it's, it's similar in Canada. We have um, the New Democratic Party, but the, but you know a lot of the time the New Democratic Party is, is laying cover fire for for capitalism um, because they're social democrats. They're tied to the system. They benefit you know the the, the leadership for the most part. You know benefits from the system they, they may have more conflict with it they may have more of a social conscience um but at the end of the day they're not you know for them as far as i know no mp NPs in canada are looking to confront the capitalist system i mean people are looking to uh, reform it or address it but, but no one is saying tear it down from 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 where i'm sitting anyways and maybe they feel like they can't but that's up to them to decide you know if they want to speak what they believe in their soul or, or if they just want to say something safe I mean, and so that's 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 our job as, as socialists, as as, or as as activists, you know, to try and convince people that that it is worth it, and that you know we're not going to lie to anybody about the risk involved um, in this kind of thing. But if if we don't fight to change it, what we've seen over um, the history of humanity, um, and especially in, in since the history of capitalism, is, is if we don't um, organize, it's just going to get worse. I mean, we watched um, we watched the, the world fall into two um, inter imperialist wars. I mean, and it, it looks like it's building in that direction again. Um, so, so I, I would say that we, we need to get organized, and it's it's not like just because of something we want. It's because if we don't, we're all going to die. I mean, whether it be climate catastrophe or nuclear apocalypse or, or whatever, and that may sound extremely dire, but I think that's the reality we're facing. If if we don't, as 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 the people of this world, as the, as the majority of people in this world, workers, peasants, all, all people who are oppressed by the ruling class, exploited by the ruling class for their profit, their power. Um, if we don't get organized, then they don't, they don't give a fuck about us. Um, they made that clear every day. I mean, and, and they, they pretend to, to sell all these great things and, and, and they're making all kinds of technological advancements. They're, they're, they're buying hospital wings so they can put their names on them. Uh, I mean, these are terrible people. And, and 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 they don't they don't they don't beat around the bush about it they don't talk about it i mean but that's that's what they're about <sighs> anyway so so I, that's that's my addressing uh, various questions about mass movements we definitely need to do that um fighting in the courts is, is also an avenue uh, that we can take i mean it, it definitely you need to do it um but you can't rely on the courts or on the media or, or on on any institution that's part of the government a part of the capitalist system to um to really solve any of these problems because they're 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 part of it they they help enforce it and, and help it operate um canada what role has they played they haven't really played a direct role i, I would say in assange they haven't come out con condemning him from what i know but it, it's it's more so just been complicity 
uh, with the United States. And I wouldn't say, as John said, that Canada is just, is just a whipping boy of the states. I mean, they are a whipping boy of the states, but not just for survival. Um, Canada is an imperialist power, a minor imperialist power. And you're right, without the states, they would be pretty much nothing. They would be walked over by somebody else. Um, um, but but with the, in, in alliance with the states and other Western European powers, um, they still exploit the world. They, they, they were in Afghanistan with, with um, America. They didn't go into Iraq um, as explicitly as the U.S. and Britain. Um, but, they're, but they're still involved all around the world in, in repression. And, um, and definitely, like, like, um, like I mentioned earlier, the Panama Papers, there's, there's all kinds of pressure on the government to release the names of the people involved in the Panama Papers, and they won't even do that. So you, you see where they, where they land in this. And they have done nothing, no, no questioning even of, of the Julian Assange case. No address to the WikiLeaks because they don't want to talk about it. They want to pretend like it doesn't exist. If you watch the, the, the Trudeau government, the Liberals now, they're in complete damage control mode. I mean, maybe they're easing off a little bit, but since um, SNC-Lavalin, since uh, the, the Panama Papers, since the, the blackface, since um, all, all this stuff, they, 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 they don't, they're just pretending like it didn't happen. And they're just trying to push out their messaging and, and, and what they say they're doing. And, um, and 30 seconds. Thank you. Um, uh, so, so yeah, that's, that's what they're looking to do. And then in terms of, um, so that's what, so that's what they've done with Julian Assange. I mean, Canada is just, is, is, is with the U S empire totally. And they, they, they have interests in having Assange persecuted and having him uh, muzzled and, and having other, um, journalists and, and, and whatnot muzzled. So they're, they're right there with their other states, not, not for survival, but because it, 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 it is within their interests of the Canadian ruling class. Um, definitely um, with how we can fight back against the media, I'll just say quickly that, um, that social media, although it is censored and, and is controlled by, um, by billionaires and by, by the capitalist class in, in large, it is, it, it is open because they have to, as, as was mentioned, they have to maintain that. Please um, wrap up. That, yeah, they have to maintain that um, appearance of, of, of free expression. Um, and so it is an opportunity to reach people. And I think we can take advantage of that um, and, and continue to build our own um, uh, media and communications like, like this program. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Corey. So we're going back to Kurt for our last three questions. Kurt? Okay, our first question comes from Barry Wiseletter. He asks, Trudeau covers up crimes committed by Canadian forces and the RCMP with racism and sexual harassment, where racism and sexual harassment are routine. By pressing Ottawa to speak up for Assange, can we raise critical awareness? Dinner with Franklin asks, do we know if there are any parties in the UK that would encourage the courts to release Assange should they be elected? And Barry Wiseletter asks again, how weak is a capitalist order that its rulers feel compelled to silence and punish journalists that report the truth and in the case of WikiLeaks just show the murder of civilians by US troops? Okay, so we're going to go back to our panel and we will start with John, then Corey, then Jeff, and please, panelists, keep within five minutes. Thank you. John? Uh, okay, Trudeau covers up crimes committed by forces in the RCP where racism and sexual harassment are routine. By pressing Ottawa to speak up for Assange, I, 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 I got to tell you guys, like, I think the best that we can do for Assange is, is to just keep talking amongst each other to try and press uh, maybe the NDP, maybe the Greens, but... I feel like we need to sort of be realistic about uh, what we're going to see with Julian Assange, that should he be released, it would be a massive surprise. And should any justice come his way, that would be even more surprising than any of that, right? Like, um, to me, the really interesting question is this last one. How weak is the capitalist order? This is the thing about this whole conversation, right? These capitalists are incredibly weak. They need us way more than we need them. They're a worthless, parasitic boil on the side of the society, right? They do no work. They offer no value. They provide nothing. They do nothing. They are worthless. We could get rid of them in a day, right? It lit this is how weak the capitalist class actually is. If everybody just got together and stood outside uh, uh, the parliament building or whatever, for a day, that would be the end of them, right? Like, if we if we all got together, stood outside, and said, we're just going to 
stand outside until this is over, until these guys just acquiesce, until they give up, uh, it would be over, right? It would either be that they would give up, we would seize their assets and redistribute it back into the society and tell them to sit down and no longer participate in our politics, or they would be forced to be just let's get rid of this democratic facade, right? They let, let, let's, let's just open fire on the populace. Let's just rule by force, which is obviously what they want to be doing. Right. But if the black lives matter movement proved anything whatsoever, it's that the citizenry is more powerful than their, than their police forces. The citizenry is more powerful than any of this. And once we get into the streets like one of the major things that came out of the Black Lives Matter movement is we got a bunch of people into the streets and now suddenly we have a whole bunch of people who are elected into halls of power from this movement. And that's just going to continue. But that only continues if we get out onto the streets, because ultimately these capitalists are weak. All they have is the smoke and mirrors that they put in front of us. I said earlier, the capitalists are only good at one thing, and that's propaganda. That's lying. That's creating illusions, right? You know how you smash illusions apart? You all get into the same space at the same time, and you look at one another, and you say, all of that is bullshit. We, we I'm going to get a little more existential here. I love to, I love to do that. We as humans have the capacity to manifest our imaginations into reality. We as humans have the ability to create around us the world that we want to see, but it requires large groups of people agreeing with one another simultaneously in order to achieve that. And that's not going to happen if we allow 10 billionaires to control this large-scale lying propaganda apparatus when we could smash it by literally going outside all at once and declaring it complete and total bullshit. That's how weak these guys are. They're incredibly weak. They can be defeated in a day. We just need to organize and do it. Elizabeth, are you there? Sorry. Yes. Having technical problems. Sorry, but Corey, you're on. Okay, thank you. Um, so, yeah, uh, Trudeau covers up crimes, the Canadian forces, and RCMP for sure. I mean, um, can we raise critical awareness um, by promoting Julian Assange? I think I think for sure. I think I think by promoting all these things, we can we can raise raise um is critical thinking, critical awareness around these issues. I mean, but we have we have to be consistent, of course, and we have to we have to take criticism, listen to it, and 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 and, and think about it and give it back to them. I mean, but but yeah, I, I think that we need to be organized around these things, not just by pressuring Ottawa. I mean, I think pressuring Ottawa is not going to amount to anything, but I think exposing the hypocrisy that Ottawa um, orchestrates, I think I think that will have a great effect on people because it already does. I mean. We see in, in these sort of right-wing movements, I mean, some of them are, are so uh, muddled and whatnot, but but there is support for like Assange, for instance, within a lot of these uh, right-wing movements. Is there sort of anti-establishment as they think there's sort of like a, a liberal socialism or whatever government in Canada and the United States sort of oppressing them um, through through whatever, they're, they're, I don't know. Um, but but anyways, if, if we talk to these people and, and we, we connect the dots between Assange, who they understand is telling the truth, and, and the other elements of the capitalist system and, and its subversion of the uh, um, entire population, basically, I mean, I, I think that the capitalists would prefer not to rule through force. I think that if they can rule through the media, it's, it's much better. I mean, um, it's, it's much cheaper for them. They don't have to hire guards with guns and, and convince them that they're doing the right thing by protecting billionaires. I mean, because, yeah, people want dollars, but but at the end of the day, if they're asking you to just murder people, I think a lot of people would have a problem with that unless they're, like, super indoctrinated or, or super privileged by um, by the capitalist system. Um, so that's my take on that. Uh, in terms of parties in the UK, uh, Jeremy Corbyn did support Julian Assange. Um, 
and he, he, he called for them, him not to be extradited as leader of the Labour Party. Um, Keir Starmer's Labour Party is much different, uh, definitely in line with, um, with British uh, imperialism and British capitalism. And, um, and so I don't think you're going to find any of the same solidarity from, from him or his establishment. But definitely within the Labour Party, there's, um, there's support for Julian Assange still. And I'm sure that will be um, a, a battle in that party um, as, 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 whatever, as, as they go forward. Um, in terms of how weak the capitalist order is, ruler feels that they have to compel, they have to punish journalists, report the truth. Um, yeah, I guess it, it is a sign that they're weaker and they're, they're sort of lashing out more so um, um, and not, not, not trying to do things in, a, in, in such a, a sleight of hand way, um, but just, just bluntly calling for the extradition of Julian Assange. Um, who I don't I don't have polling numbers on, but but I'm sure that 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 most people, because everyone I talk to, I've never met someone who thinks Julian Assange is a liar and thinks that he should be extradited. Um, and I'm not just like 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 I, I have friends that are not socialists and 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 and, and everything. And so I, I've never met anybody that I can think of that has ever um, uh, basically spoken against Julian Assange in this sense. People may have um, concerns about the sexual assault, as we mentioned. Um, but in terms of the uh, the war crimes that he exposed and the persecution that the U.S. empire is 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 is, is pushing on him, um, every, everyone uh, seems to be on the same page with that. So so yeah, I think that it, it is it is um, a blatant attack by U.S. empire against this individual, and I think it does show their their fear sort of about about where this is all going. I mean about about what it could mean because they, what they need is um, is stability at home. To continue their empire abroad, and so if if people are getting organized and they're fighting back, they can't easily just go and do whatever they want around the world and rob other places, oppress other places, and set up their own set up friendly governments or or um, or, or institutions. Um, they can't do that as easily, and um, and that's that's the, that's the key about addressing your own oppressor first. Um, is is that we need to we need to tear down these capitalist states from the inside. And um, of course, the U.S. empire from the inside. Americans, um, we, we need to. We, Americans need to reach Americans, and and, and get on the same page as John. Thirty seconds. And, and, and confront um, um, this oppressed system that is that is global. I mean, it's not it's not everywhere, but every everyone needs to um, organize. I feel in a ways. Um, I don't I don't just feel. I, I believe it's the truth. Otherwise, we're going to we're going to go back into um to barbarism, as Rosa Luxemburg said. Socialism, barbarism, that's the future. She also said the most important one of the most important things you can do is is is, is say what is happening loudly. And I mean that's that's what Julian Assange has done, and that's that's what we're trying to do here. I mean, and, and I encourage you all to to do that as well. Um, so thank you. Okay. Thank you, Corey. Jeff, five minutes. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank John and Corey for their wonderful enthusiasm and fantastic insight. I want to remind you that Judge Barrister refused to extradite Julian Assange. A judge under pressure from the greatest imperial power in the world said no to the US government. She didn't do it on the grounds of civil liberties or democratic rights. She didn't want to fight with U.S. imperialism on that. She simply said, he's not a well man and your jail system is heinous, as if Belmarsh Prison isn't any worse. But that was a victory for every struggle that humanity has ever had. But that British judge of one of the greatest imperialist nations that ever existed the initiator of the slave trade that killed millions. And the British still have a monarchy that was raised up high because of its support of the slave trade and mass murder. That country had to bend and say no. We'll see what happens when the US government appeals. The United States government is militarily the most powerful nation on earth. But it's in a great economic crisis in the context of the world capitalist crisis, where there is massive disillusionment in the nature of the system itself. The Obama administration lost office because in defending the interests of the ruling class, 
it shipped millions of high paying union jobs overseas to Chinese labor at six cents an hour with teenage women working for virtually nothing because it didn't want to pay American union jobs. So they shipped them to Vietnam or they shipped them to Mexico or Indonesia or any other nation where they could have labor for virtually nothing. So they deindustrialized the United States. Some 9% of the GDP of the United States, previously the greatest manufacturing nation on earth today, comes from manufacturing. And the bulk of it comes from speculative investments in the stock market, where they don't produce any goods and services other than money in the casino capitalism stock market. So U.S. imperialism is in crisis, in competition with its with its opponents everywhere in the world, with a massive declining rate of profit, and that's because they constantly substitute constantly substitute machines for human beings, and only human beings make profit, not machines. And the result is ever declining profit rates. And the result is the efforts by the ruling classes of every nation to compensate for that by speed up, by layoffs, by shipping jobs overseas, by busting unions, by gig labor and all the rest. <clears throat> we will in time get to the point where we can, as a small group of revolutionary socialists, win over mass forces in the thousands, in the millions, and challenge the heavens to build a new world. Can't do that without the people. We can't do that by proclamations. We can't do that by setting the date for the revolution or the general strike. We can only do that, as we're doing tonight, by actively participating in every struggle where humanity tries to inch forward. And sometimes we make that inch and turn it into a mile and turn it into a new world. The day-to-day -day work of building for socialism begins with joining a party. There is no other instrument. When you join that party, you learn how to write for its newspaper. You learn how to win over your coworkers and friends and students. You learn how to organize public forums, how to go on the streets and join in solidarity with striking workers, how to build an independent party with a class struggle politics as opposed to your NDP social democratic conciliatory pro-capitalist politics. But the basic idea is that workers need their own party that they control to advance their interests to have a state that represents workers and not the capitalist few. This combination of building independent political action is crucial. Our method is not empty proclamations of what everybody has to do tomorrow. 30 seconds. But it's called the United Front. We seek to engage with all other groups, social justice, environmental, anti-racist union groups, to work together on common struggles for mass mobilizations on simple issues in the streets, because being in the streets helps to convince the millions who all their lives have told that they can't change society, that you can't change city hall, that they really are the majority, that the government is a tiny minority, and that they, if they organize that majority independently, they can win storm the heavens, and build a new world. That's why I'm here today, to join with you in building your party, which is the same name as my party, and it has the same program. We want to build an international party and national parties that fight for the working class on every issue. Thanks. Join us. Contact us in the United States, socialistaction.org. Contact Julian Assange at assange.org. Join the Defense Committee. Build your own in Canada. We'll help you out. And build the kind of massive United Front independent mobilizations that give strength to the working class, build their confidence, and allow us to take the next step towards the socialist revolution. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. 
Okay, folks, a special thanks to Jeff, John, and Corey, and of course, Court, uh, Kurt, our producer in Mississauga. Please consider being a supporter of Socialist Action Newspaper, which we will send to you online. To fill out the form, just visit our website at www.socialistaction.ca. And if you would like to talk to us about joining SA, write to Socialist Action Canada at gmail.com or just give us a call. 647-986-1917. That's 647-986-1917. Once again, listeners, if you like this show, please subscribe to the Socialist Action YouTube channel. The next essay webcast will be on Thursday, May the 13th, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. The topic is the 100th anniversary of the communist movement in Canada, featuring John Riddell, socialist activist and historian, and Barry Wiseletter, Federal Secretary of Socialist Action. In the meantime, please stay safe, stay healthy, stay active. Bye for now.